What it do, it's your boy, comedian Leroy the Third, right here with Donna Houston, the illest podcast in H Town, man. Look, y'all make sure y'all follow my dude on YouTube and any other social platform he got. Man, listen, I back Donna Houston. I'm right here, your boy Leroy the Third. I'm out. Peace. Oh, yeah. Donnie Houston. Subscribe to Donnie Houston Podcast, man. Yeah, man, it's going down. It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. Uh, we got a special guest today, man. Uh, homie is uh, doing his thing out here on the comedy circuit in the H, you know what I'm saying, and, and beyond. You know, he just packed out uh, Cafe 4212, you know what I mean? Um, hey, man, Leroy the Third, what's going down, What's man? up, man? What's going on? What's the deal, baby? Man, I'm in here at the Donnie Houston show. That's what I'm doing. Representing Mo City. I forgot to put that out there. Oh, yeah, Mo City, Ridge, Gate, Texas, to be exact. There it is. 21 right. years. Already, already. What's going down, man? Man, a uh, whole bunch of comedy, man. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep this consistency thing going. I've been in it a little bit over eight years, nine years next year, and what I've done, I, I can honestly start. This, I'm starting to see stuff pan out and play out the way it's supposed to be. You know, I've been hearing. I, I say probably since COVID started, I start hearing. You know, people saying, "I see, you, I see, you, I see you." But it was always, you know what I'm saying, I, I want to try to soak up what they're saying and try to drill it into my ego just a little bit, but it never happened. So now I say about this year, I honestly start seeing an evolution in myself, and I really start seeing a change in evolution, man. So this year has been real good to me, man. Uh, I actually came out of retirement on doing shows. I hadn't did a, a comedy show for like five or six years. Hmm. Actually, it just you thrown, mean putting on your own yeah, show, producing yeah. from through the, uh, through and through. You know, I've been doing the uh, open mics. I put on those shows, but those weren't one hundred percent mine. So I said, man, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and do it because I know what the logistics of it is. It can become stressful. But what I told myself, I'm like, man, I'm I'm 43 now. So what I got to do? I got to make sure I'm spread myself too thin. I can't stress myself out. I can't do everything last minute. Let me do this and that. Uh, I'm gonna do away with all the extra stuff. I'm gonna stick with the with the basics, and my basics should be awesome at this point to the outsiders. So that's exactly what I did, and I wanted to ultimately prove it to myself that I had this in me. So when I walked in there, I knew it was gonna be nice. I didn't know it was gonna be like that. Hmm. So that was that was it right there. And ever since then, man, it's been nonstop, dog. Nonstop. I mean, it's been nonstop, but it's been nonstop in my mental. As far as I got to keep this running, I got to keep this running. Yeah. yeah. What? What? Um. You say you've been doing it about eight years. What? What inspired you to like, you, like comedy wise? You know what I'm saying? Well, man, just like a lot of comics, man, we all in school were some type of class clown, acted out. You know what I'm saying? That's just what you do. Matter of fact, with me, I was so troubled and bad in school shit my my old man used to uh he was a computer engineer he used to uh make conduct sheets monday through friday and i had to take them to my teacher and have each one of them sign off that's how bad the motherfucker i was i was fucking terrible so i would go in there and it got to the point that i was like man i can just force the teacher's name <laughs> and i started doing that shit and then, of course, if you act in the fool, them, dra- them grades start slipping. Then you get written up. But back then, they used to write you up and send the discipline slips home. But I got home before my parents, so guess what? The discipline slips is going in the gutter. So 
<laughs> I don't know if it's a uh, it that exists down there or whoever lived in that gutter or that bayou. You know how bad I was because there's plenty of discipline slips, progress reports, all that shit. My man, but like, hey, Canessa and Tony say they got their, their report going progress report. Where you at? But shit, they they probably ain't put my grades in yet or some <laughs> shit. So what, 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 why were you tripping so much? I don't know. I think well, I was diagnosed with ADHD back in I think seventh eighth grade but i'm pretty sure i had been having this shit they just, just put a name official yeah. yeah so what happened was i went from being hyper disruptive i was i was always respectful and then uh my parents i remember we went to the psychiatrist i'll never forget this shit and i was acting a fool and uh they said well we're gonna put this nigga on something slow his motherfucking ass down it was called Ritalin back then so i take the shit <laughs> so I'm in class But what happened is I developed a, a OCD For certain things Like I would be writing a paper Back when I was in school You had to write on the front And back on college rule paper So I can get to the back of the page The back of the page And be at the bottom And fuck up on a word And basically tear that shit up And write, rewrite it again So I developed a whole bunch of OCD With that shit too But my grades went from Straight F's and D's To straight B's and A's, so that Ritalin man. Now they what? The, what's the shit they take nowadays? Uh, what's the shit that the, the blue collar motherfuckers take? Hip they mind function. Adderall. Adderall. That's the shit. That's the same shit. That's the same shit. But the thing is, um, with my kids, like my oldest, he was suffering from ADHD. And then the thing is, back then, she used to get on your kid's ass for acting up. They go back to school, do the same shit. So with him, I was like, man, let me see what the real problem is instead of getting on his ass, you know what I'm saying, and see what kind of, you know, see what's really going on. But, you know, you just kind of open up that line of communication and then eventually he kind of talked to you and then he slowed down. And a lot of times it's a lot of acting out as well. So I came up in the 80s, man. So you see a lot, even though you had both parents in the house, you still see a lot. You understand know what I'm saying? So I think everything had a little part to play in it. Uh, as of right now, I don't think I'm ADHD. I'm more ADD. I can sit my ass down now. You know what mm. I'm saying? Mm. Man, okay. Well, man, tell me, uh, you know, even before the comedy. You right. Know, uh, the boys had a different type of situation going on. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I see where you go. You know, uh, tell me a little bit about this because there, there was somebody put out a documentary. Right. I don't. I don't know who. I just remember somebody came right. across a documentary about these right. kids who left school and went to go rob a bank. You there know you what I'm saying? Got caught up, and these niggas was from Mo City. Right. And the shit just tripped me out. Right. You know what I'm saying. So you actually seen the documentary? I saw the documentary. Okay. I wish I could see it again. I was right. trying to find it, but I can't remember where. You know, I saw YouTube, it. Uh, Apple. It was on Netflix. What's the name of it? Evolution of a Criminal. Evolution. Of Shout a out criminal. Darius Clark Monroe. What's up, bro? Uh, 1997 January. Uh, me and a couple dudes. We decided that that's gonna make it happen. So we did just that, and uh, I mean. Uh, Two of us got caught up for it. One of them ran his jawline. <coughs> wait, wait, okay, wait, wait. So, so here's my thing. What's up? This was a random. We just gonna do this. Y'all hadn't been on. What were y'all doing prior? Leading like y'all wasn't hitting no stat. Like what? You know what I'm saying? Because this is a this ain't no small right, time right, deal. Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, before that, I'm gonna be honest with you. It was probably little stuff here and there. Nothing to the extent or nothing even remotely as close as that. Uh, I remember us watching, uh, I believe it was Set It Off back in the day. And that kind of triggered some stuff too. That along with <clears throat> all the the double disc Tupac albums. <laughs> <laughs> Parents, y'all listen to what your kids listen to. I'm telling you because it does play a part. Music does play the a music part. Music influence. Yeah, it definitely does. Because... Um, when we actually got to the bank, uh, we had second thoughts. So they both came back. I was driving. They both came back like, man, you know, I ain't feeling this. And I remember turning on the radio and they had some Tupac on. I can't remember what song it was, but it hyped it up and it went the fuck back in there. And the rest is fucking history. 
So that's what I'm saying. You got to always, I think a lot of times, I'm all over the place, but I think a lot of times parents be trying to be their kids' friend instead of being a parent. You ain't got to be a super strict motherfucker, but you fuck that friend shit. You know what I'm saying? Friends, you ain't got to, you don't feed your friends and pay all their fucking bills and your kids. But, uh, I mean, that's what it was. We just said, fuck it. I don't think nothing really just led up to it. It was just this, this, and that. And I was saying, you know what? Fuck it. Mm. Yeah, so. Okay, so tell me how y'all put this plan together. Break break this whole shit down. Break, break, this break me down. Shit, I got to go back 20 some odd years. Let me see. Because this was so, this, it just tripped me out that, right. that something that, for one, that these kids would do it that weren't like career criminal, quote right. unquote. You know what I'm saying? Right. And this shit happened in Houston, in, in Houston, most city, whatever. You know right. what I'm saying? But, well, I was the oldest. I was 17. It was 16. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, y'all are just regular kids, really. Y'all ain't yeah, just nothing. regular kids. Um, one of the guys was my neighbor, stayed next door. Smart guy, made straight A's, well known. Uh, then you had me, the class clown. And then you had the other guy, which is, you know, just a young kid trying to, I don't know, try to fit in. Trying, I don't to, know, yeah. trying to fit in or whatever. So we came up with this, and I remember, uh, God rest the dead, uh, one of my best friends that passed away. We was basically just kind of recruiting. Hey, man, you know, asking about such and such. He said, okay, this is one guy. I said, okay. That fool, okay, that's the dude that be skipping school with and shit. So not thinking, you can't, and that, that's what I always tell people, man. Listen, I used to tell people that. You can't go from something, I mean, excuse me, you can't go from nothing to a whole bunch of something and expect a person to keep that under wraps and quiet, especially a child. You know what I'm saying? So we was basically looking for somebody to get down that was about that. And just so happened this dude name came up And it ultimately just kind of backfired You know what I'm saying And for years I kind of held on to that That resentment All that you know what I'm saying That I gotta get at this dude type shit Until you know once I got older And started thinking and started having my own kids You gotta realize It ain't so It's only so solid a person can be At 16 You know what I'm saying When he pressed by professional adults Somewhere along the lines You're going to break So I mean Ultimately me and my homeboy That directed the movie He's a filmmaker now He studied under Spike Lee And everything Went to NYU uh, We the ones that Had to go through the, the probation We the ones that had to do Prison time This guy never did time Or anything The one that Talked and he came and, and, and okay, so okay, take me through the whole take me through the whole thing of doing this shit. So y'all sit down, y'all put this plan together. Y'all say, why did y'all choose the bank? How did, like how that whole shit went down? You know what I'm saying? So I really don't even remember how we chose that location. You know, when you young, you just used to whatever, what's in your vicinity. You know, what I'm saying? you know it's a bank right here. <laughs> you know it's a bank right there that's not too far. Mm-hmm. Cause we don't know at that time, shit. We we sixteen, seventeen years old. We, we oblivious to the north side. So um, we gonna do what's furthest yet not too far from. It, you understand what I'm saying? So I remember me and my homeboy just, just kind of sitting around. He said, "Yo, I think I got a prospect." So we went by there, and I remember uh, he said he was gonna go in there and ask about opening a checking account. So I went in there with them. And I remember they had a box camera. You walk in the door. <laughs> and it was an old school box camera above the door. And I shit you not, it was a box camera. That was the weirdest shit. So I was like, okay, that's the only camera I see. So we talked about it. I'm like, shit, all right, let's plan it out. Let's plan it out. So I remember uh, when it came time for that day for them to go in there, we had spray paint, black spray paint, kind of like on the movies. So he went in there. I, I want to say we had walkies or we didn't use them. I can't remember. But uh, I don't even remember if the uh, camera got sprayed. But one of the main things I remember is I told the dude, I was like, yo, don't put no shells in that shotgun. We don't need that. And I wanted to find out later on that he did, in fact, put shells in this. So God, I mean, Jesus Christ. Thank God he didn't. Awesome. I mean, excuse me. Thank God nothing 
happen to where it was a shootout that occurred in there because it would have been much more than a robbery. It would have been a murder, some capital murder type shit. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went through it. Excuse me. Let me rewind a little bit. Before we went there, that was around the time people was having bomb threats in schools. So what we did was stop at a pay phone and we made a call to the police department and staff it saying that it's a suspicious uh, package outside of an elementary school. I can't remember what school it was. So what that was in set in place to do is what to deter the Kid police over there. They're already out of the way. they already out the way. While we go do what we got to do and then slow down. So after we did everything, I went right back by the uh, actual pay phone that we made the call from. It was the side street. And we just passed right by them slow as hell. And by the time I got there, I shit you not, it was probably maybe 10, 12 cop cars right there. So I just passed right by them going the speed limit. Everybody was reclined, laying back in the seat and shit. And I'm be honest with you, I've never, when they say anxiety, your adrenaline rush and your nervousness and all that shit, this was like to the moon. I've never felt like this This before. is after y'all ride it back. This is after. How do y'all go in there? Y'all just what, slide the note or what y'all do? Well, I was a driver. So what they did, uh, they got close the first time they turned around. Second time they went in there and they announced what it is. And so after that, ain't nothing else to be said. So the thing was, we don't want nothing in the till, nothing in the drawers. and want straight safe because we know either you got to die or the explosion, the tracker or something in them tills. We don't want none of that. We want shit straight out the safe. So disregard all that shit. So they went straight to the safe. And I can't remember how much it was. I know it was over a hundred some thousand dollars. Hmm. Yeah. They worked out of that way. Yeah. Okay, so boom, y'all leave, y'all in the car, y'all pass the pay phone, boom. All right. So after that, we we stay over there and uh, I'm from Ridgegate. So we can went back to the old part of Mo City. And it was a park back there. I don't even think it exists. They probably put houses on it. And uh we got there, and even back then, what I never understood, how people hold on to shit. I never understood that shit. Even as an adult, I was thinking like that as a kid. Why are you holding on to these shoes and this jacket and everything else? First thing we did was discard everything down a gutter. If y'all know what a gutter is, a storm drain. <laughs> we threw everything down there, and we went back to school. So at this time, you're so nervous and paranoid, like extremely paranoid. <clears throat> So we know we got all this money in this car. My thing is, I'm not leaving my half in here. Well, I ain't leaving my half in here. So that paranoia and that 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 feeling like every, somebody's going to fuck over one another. I said, let me stuff. I had a, uh, I think it was a leather bomber jacket or something like that. I'm stuffing what I can in that motherfucker. I'm a whole mind. So mm -hmm. I go back to class and the, the state of paranoia being in class. I was in Woodshop. Never forget that shit. Everybody come through the door. I'm, I'm tripping. I'm spazzing the fuck out at this time, right? So, went to school. Then after that, uh, we went home. So, you still got that paranoia. And I'm going to be honest with you. That state of paranoia, that level of paranoia, it really ain't even worth that bread. Because hmm. it damn to dry your ass crazy. Hmm. Yeah. Damn, okay, so boom, go ahead. I mean, what is she was? No, I mean, you're going. You, you go there and you're paranoid. Okay, boom. Okay, so we get back to the house. So we, we kind of laying low. Um, old buddy, he go his way. He stayed in the front part of Missouri City. My homeboy stayed in his door. So we're kind of going back and forth, but just really laying low. And then... I started hearing certain shit about the dude uh, starting to splurge, starting to talk. So at this point, I'm like, yo, what is he doing? And that's when I start, that's my concept. If you don't never do anything that involves money with a person that ain't never had shit. Because you go from having nothing to a whole lot of something, it's going to show. You may not even say nothing, but it's going to show. So I kind of faulted that for myself. A lot of people don't think of those those certain situations and shit like that. So, uh, fast forward through that, it may have been a a month, 
And then you start hearing whispers in school and shit. Hey, man, I heard this. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Then that paranoia started coming by. And I remember one time I was actually, I don't think I've ever told this story in public. I was actually walking back from the house, excuse me, from school. And I used to cut through the neighborhood, go through a vacant house, come out on the fence on Court Road. And it was two chicks had a car stalled out with their hood up. So I'm walking, I'm looking, at this time carrying a pistol to school. So they kind of flag, hey, uh, can you look at our car? It's like, what the hell? Ain't shit I could do. I'm just coming back from school. I don't know shit about no damn engines. I said, I don't know. They said, well, can we use your phone? I said, I'm, I'm going to go get the car on the phone. Y'all stay right there. At this time, I'm tripping. So I go in the house, and I'm kind of looking out the blinds and shit, trying to see if they still there. I said, all right, well, let me go get the car this phone. Back then, it was the car. They pull up the mm-hmm. antenna type shit. And right before I was going to go back out there, I looked out again, and they kind of shrugged their shoulders and closed the hood, jumped in that bitch, and burned off. So it was another time I had a situation. I ain't gonna speak on that too much, but uh, yeah, I had some. I had some niggas try to do some shit behind some bread. And I had to make them get away. So that was another. Uh, that was another blessing for my grandmother, my praying grandmother. She had been deceased at that time, so I know we all we came. We really can't put on the way we are or try to give uh, full blessings to our parents for the way we've been raised or the way we are or how we've survived or anything like that. I, you got to put it on to the grandparents. If we went for praying grandparents, because our parents was probably in Oasis or fucking Carol's or something the whole time. So um, that was just another blessing right there, man. So. Uh, man, it was a whole ordeal. So, anyway, my homeboy wound up getting caught up behind the shit, right? And uh, he ended up getting because the dude talked. Because the dude talked. I mean, it may have been an accumulation of stuff, but ultimately, it's because the guy talked. So he was going through his shit. And he was letting me know, like, yo, they asking this and that. Uh, you ain't got to worry about nothing on this end. You know what I'm saying? Which was solid. I said, okay, cool. So, at this time, you know, my parents start getting word of what's going on because my mama drove buses for the high school. So, I remember uh, coming home from school. Matter of fact, I was like, man, you know what? You know, you got some money in your pocket. I ain't going home. I'm 17. Nigga. My mama paid me 911. <laughs> so, you know what? I ain't coming. Like the dude on Harlem Nights, hey, yo, mama, I'm not coming home no more. <laughs> you know, I got these couple thousand in my pocket. Um, Anyway, so we went to the gallery. I remember that night. Went to the gallery, got my black ass on the ice uh, skating rink. Caught a concussion. First and only time. Slipped. Bam. And I remember they had like a Bennigan's or a Chili's in there. Hmm. I'm in a, a Bennigan's or Chili's. I'm all clouded and shit. I'm like, man, look, I'm going to go back to your crib. I'm going to go by my house tomorrow, get some things. I ain't going back to the house. You know, I'm really thinking big headed. So I go to the crib. Parents comment in the room. Let like, man, what's up? So, you got something to tell us? Nah, what you talking about? Then my mama reached behind. I had all my money in a tube sock. I had it stuffed in rolls. And heart just dropped. Like, how the first of all, how the fuck you find this? So kids, don't think you can hide anything <laughs> in your parents' house because they know every nook and cranny you they fucking child. So what I used to do is pull my drawer. Out. Then you reach in like up under here. How the fuck? I don't. I have the slightest <laughs> idea to this fucking day. I'm gonna ask my mama how the fuck they find this shit out. So up until that point in 1997, my old man was like, "Yo, we gotta get rid of this. We gotta get rid of that, nigga. Putting blankets on the windows and shit. I can only wear. I remember I had a pair of old navy." Uh, Wingtip shoes. I'll never forget this shit. That's the only goddamn shoe you gotta look <laughs> broke. <laughs> look like you're dirty. I was wearing the same pair of fucking shoes. And I remember I had an old navy blue shirt. I never forget it was a polo style shirt. It was a V neck right here with the collar. I never forget that shit because I had to wear the shit all the time. And I had a Kohan belt. But um, man, listen, this shit was crazy as hell. Then I went to Progressive to get my GED. Shout out Progressive High School. Mm. Hater, 
Anyway. <laughs> she went to work. That's trash. Anyways, um, so they was like, man, you know they're going to come for you eventually. I ain't worried about that. So I'm trying to get my mind right, get my GED focused and go to college. So uh, I remember the assistant principal saying, hey, Leroy, uh, Steph, I need to talk to you. No problem. Yes, ma'am. And back then, you had to take shirts in. No, yes, ma'am. Say you leave Roy Camp. Say why? You need to turn around. You got the right to remain. So I say ah. So they took me to Stafford uh, Police Department. Never forget this shit. So I'm in. Mean, they take my shoestrings and shit. Like, I'm gonna kill myself. And uh, they say you got a phone call. Uh, I say who the fuck is this? So I get on the phone. It's my lawyer. God bless the dead, Miss Bernadette John Lewis, from my lawyer from 1997 up until what? By Five, six years ago, she passed away. Five years ago, about five years ago. Big lady, she had to be like four hundred fifty pounds, ghetto as hell. <laughs> She's like, "Hey, this is your lawyer. Your parents got uh, hired me to represent you. Don't tell them motherfuckers nothing. Don't sign shit, just like that." I said, "Okay, I'm on some real shit, then. Them some mob shit." <laughs> so they brought me into the interrogation room. I say, we state your name, is your name, uh, no, it says, state your name. Is your name such and such? I say, shit, y'all pull me in this motherfucker. I don't know what my <laughs> name is. You tell me. And they looked at each other. Phone rung again. <laughs> you got to tell them your damn name at least. Don't, don't be too damn crazy. I say, well, you told me not to say a motherfucker thing. So, automatically went on, uh, uh, I bonded out. They put me on anchor monitor. I was going through all that shit. Then they agreed to put me on probation. They took the money and all that shit or what? The shit, I'm be honest with you. The rest of the money, basically, <laughs> you do what you do with some of the money, and the rest of the money went towards lawyer fees to fight the fucking case that I got in the first place. So basically, I robbed a bank for the experience. <laughs> Dumb ass shit. I hate people. So, um, I got put on probation because I was a, a, a kid. But I was still served as an adult. So uh, I had to do, I think, at 17, I think I maybe maybe three months in county, then come back on probation, seven years. But the thing is, you can't take a motherfucker that's been doing crazy shit, robbing, doing all kind of other shit, then put him on probation at 17 and think he going to straighten up. So I violated like four times over the course of five years. Violate, violate, violate. And I remember the judge in Fort Bend told me, he's like, man, look, before I reinstate you this time, that was the third time, he said, look out that window. You see that tree right there at the curb? I'm looking. Like, he said, you don't see that tree? I said, no, sir, I don't see no tree. If you violate again, by the time you get out, it's going to be a full-grown fucking tree right there. I say, God damn. So, of course, what I did was violate again. And I went before the same fucking judge. And he knew exactly who I was. So, they was trying to, they gave me a chance to sign for five years. So, I'm on that, uh, on that crate now. I ain't signing for shit. Fuck what you talking about, nigga. I listen to screw. <laughs> <laughs> Everything he screwed down and say, nigga, we ain't copping, please. Ignit than a motherfucker, right? But nah, I just wasn't signing for shit. So uh, when I went to court, they tried to give me 15 years. So at this point, I'm like, yo, all right, whatever. So I ultimately wound up getting seven years. So they gave me seven years aggravated time. And anybody ever did aggravated time, or what they used to call back then, I don't even know if they still have 3G. Uh, that means you have to do half before you even think about making parole. So I know when I got the time, I was like, well, shit, I got to do seven years. I didn't know how that went. But then they said, nah, you ain't got to do seven flat unless you fucking up. As you said, you have to do three and a half before you even think about seeing parole. So, I mean, you go down there, you go through a... Basically, you, you treat it how you carry yourself, of course. But you go through that depression shit because I had a newborn. My son was like four months. Five months old when I got locked up. Then you thinking about your gal fucking another nigga. You just laying in the bunk. I got egg time. I can't get a job. I'm in the county a year. These niggas getting on my motherfucking nerve, lying like a motherfucker. <laughs> I'm thinking I got to do seven. So 
all that is what formed and made my ass click. Like, yo, what the fuck am I doing? This shit's retarded. So uh, I wound up doing right at four years. And I'll be honest with you, man. Uh, back then, that's probably the best thing that could have happened to me. Hmm. It ultimately saved my fucking life. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. Man, so then you jump out. So how long is it between you getting out and deciding to do comedy? Got out in 2000, December 8th, 2004. I started doing comedy, let's say, nine years ago. Oh, a little minute. Yeah, so I had a little minute. So when I got out, uh, I was a family man. I had another child. I was married. And you did that for about nine years. Um, and after that, you know, I just kept pushing on the comedy, kept pushing on the comedy. But uh, like I said, I met this guy outside of Third War. I was coming out of D-Bar back when it was Dollar. And uh, I said, man, we got the barbecue, man. I'm going to go grab something right quick. So while they was making my sandwich, they made y'all catch like comedy. Said, yeah, man, they been saying I didn't need to do comedy since I was a kid. He said, well, I got an open mic. I do, uh, I think it was South Park somewhere. I was like, all right, cool. So I went by there for like three weeks. On that third week, uh, God bless the dead, big juice. I seen like everybody else impactful in my life is deceased now. So I went at first time I couldn't imagine getting on stage. That just wasn't anything I was even thinking about doing. Second time, same thing. Third time I went, it had to be like seven, eight people in the building. He had everybody saying my name when he called called me up there. So I was like, all right, well, I might as well go up there. So I went up there. I said a joke about uh, uh, raising little boys. How uh, some boys, in my opinion, uh, tend to have different mannerisms. You know what I'm saying? Because of the lack of proper uh, posture correction. So I said, I came home from work one day. My son's sitting on the couch like this, watching Nickelodeon. <laughs> I said, Nick, stick your ass up. Ain't no boy, think you a girl or a boy. Ain't no boy sit like that. So I think a lot of times it comes from the lack of proper posture correction. So I got a laugh. I don't know if it was a call for a laugh, but I was like, who was that over there? <laughs> and I was just hooked. I was like, yo, this is dope. He's actually laughing at me. And I don't even know this dude. After that, like, man, let me go ahead and talk about some old shit. And I was like, man, this is nice. It makes me feel good. It became therapeutic. So I was like, okay, the stress I was dealing with, you know, with day-to-day -day life, I was able to get up on the stage and project that and just let that, that stress off, just like going into the gym. So it became a norm to me and addictive to where I was spending a lot of time doing it. You know what I'm saying? And then, uh, like, me coming up in comedy, uh, I didn't have a lot of people kind of big bro and giving me the game. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to uh, Comedian Grossman and Blame the Comet. And shout out to Ali Sadiq for giving me my first uh, major room at the Duck Off. Uh, it wasn't really major, but he gave me my first room. I ran it for like four years, four and a half years. Shout out to Duck Off. Um, and I ran that for about four years, but who gave me the game was Comedian Grossman. You know, I could call Ali. We both Libras. We both paroled out of the same unit, actually. So when we talk on the phone, <laughs> it's like, so, uh, yeah. How's the family? <laughs> Family's good. How's your family? All right, man. God bless you. I'll see you later. But he's always, I remember he used to uh, do uh, Diallo's in Third Ward. And you being there, you, you nervous as hell. You want to go up. But you ain't tripping if you don't go up. So I'm Leroy the third, so I live get off stage and he, you know you next. I'm like, all right, cool. So you shit. Okay, I'm next. I'm not fuck. And he'll get up there after the comic, uh, then got off stage. So he finna, you know, he do a joke or two. And he'll go into there. All right, well, I'm finna bring up the next comic. I read for the next comic. So you like, shit, he finna call my name. Heart beating out your chest. All right. Y'all already clapping. Y'all already clapping. Y'all give it up for Titus Wilson. He called somebody else up. <laughs> so you're like, oh, man, it's just too much on my mental. You know what I'm saying? It's too much on my mental. And then eventually, he said, all right, you next. 
I said, all right, either he going to do it or he don't. He going to fuck with me. So he said, all right. And he looked at me. Y'all give it up for Leroy Jr. <laughs> so first of all, it was Leroy the third. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Ever since then, then we sat down. And uh, we had a lot in common. And the thing I respect about him that he's aggressive. You know what I'm saying? Where he feels he needs to be aggressive. You're going to respect him. He's going to make you respect him. Thing I like about Grossman, Grossman's like a big bro. I could talk to him about life shit when it comes to the comedy, and I could talk to him about comedy. Uh, and he always had me hosting like his birthday shows or whatever. So I've gained a lot of exposure on that as well. But um, and then shout out Blame the Comedy. You heard of Blame the Comedy? Yeah. Oh yeah, he a beast too. Get out there and shoot the club up at the end. But uh, those three fellas. They really kind of paved the way. Well, excuse me, gave me a lot of advice. So I was like, all right, well, I don't want to have to go to somebody's room and have to wait to be called upon. Let me start my own room. So I started at a strip club. Mm. I mean, it's tore down now. I'm talking about it. This is the place where strippers went to die. This wasn't no Onyx. This wasn't no shit. Stripper come talk. Like, oh, hold on, bitch. I ain't on you. Go back over there. I'm talking about the bitches with the glitter lotion on their chest. And uh, they gave me a side room, and I had a little Bluetooth, you know, the speakers you can buy from Fiesta, have all the flashing light mm -hmm. shit. And I'll Bluetooth my phone. So I'll be like, yeah, all right, coming to stage. Y'all give it up for such and such. Boop. And I turned the music on. I had no DJ or nothing. Then you see a roach or two crawl mm -hmm. by and shit. You know, it was crazy as hell. So. I did it over there, but I wasn't even getting paid. They give me a bar tab. So I remember they would give me a hundred dollar bar tab and at the end of the night I might have fifty five dollars left. And you know what a nigga gonna do. They don't gonna drink all this yeah. shit. And I fuck around, get home, wreck my goddamn car. <laughs> I never fuck <laughs> So it was just a whole learning uh process, but I think the biggest when it really started kinda showing light at the end of the tunnel was probably the duck off and I was able to do that like I was saying like four plus years and I actually was able to rub shoulders with you know some people that was coming in town shout out nephew Tommy and I built some very long lasting relationships out of there with comics um, and then uh, of course they had to unfortunately they had to shut down just like all businesses come to an end eventually uh, some sooner than others uh, from there I went to a couple of different spaces in third ward and then uh, where I wound up going after that I think it was the main street no no I went to swagger I went to swagger then COVID came so they pulled a the plug on that so uh, main street lounge was still open that's the old maxwell's mm -hmm. so i ran that for like two and a half years man shout out to ab main street lounge you got prime 44 on the north side and greens point if you're going by there make sure your doors is locked because <laughs> you're going in your shit but um uh, i ran that for like two and a half years and that was dope i was able to rub shoulders with a lot of celebrities uh coming through there uh getting my name out and uh i started building more of a fan base opposed to the duck off I had supporters so when I got to Main Street I had I was building a fan base and then my supporters was coming in so it was mixed in so I call them all supporters now so uh, moved around a couple other places you know don't have to mention those then I went back to Swagger so me going back to Swagger was like then they're like going back home. Hmm. So other than that, yeah, that's swagger. That's every Tuesday. That's every Tuesday live at Swagger, ten o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make sure y'all pull up. But other than that, I have my bookings. And uh, you mentioned the forty two twelve earlier. Like I said, man, I I knew it was gonna be crazy, but I didn't know it was gonna be like that. And my phone been nonstop. I'm gonna be honest with you, but nonstop they want me to do. 4212 offered me a, a nice deal. Hmm. They say you can do whatever the hell you want and we we'll break you off at the bar type shit. So I'm like, yeah, okay. But the thing about me is I'm a perfectionist. I'm always trying to, I'm always trying to outdo the last thing. I don't want, like, 
I was saying earlier, I developed OCD. It still kind of sticks with me. So I was probably the first one to do comedy in First Colony Mall mm. at the middle, the middle Spoon. They wanted me back over there a few times, but I had already did that. I didn't want. I wanted to outdo that. So I had backed up from doing shows, like I said, by five, six years. So now I'm trying to see what, how can I outdo the birthday I just had next year? So I'm already working on that. So, um, shit, it's it's just all about growth for me right now mm. and consistency. That's what it is, yeah. man. That's what it is, man. Mm. I appreciate you coming through, man. Shit, straight up, man. I appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, for what sure, man. For sure. I mean, we had, we had been, you know, talked, you know, loosely, you know what I mean? Right, and right, then, right. Like I say, when I started coming out, checking out the spots with my boy Chakeem, man. I was right. Like, okay, you right there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, we got to make that happen. So, yeah. yeah, he just started, man. Shout out my boy Elijah, Shaquem Elijah Wong. Shaquem Elijah Wong. Yeah, man. man. Boy, good guy, way, good man. guy. Been working at Domino 32 years. Yeah. But, hey, that guy's a grinder. And he a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> he ain't no teacher no more. He ain't no man. teacher no more? He'll nah, be nah, back. Nah, 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 he ain't gonna be back. He ain't gonna be back? Nah, I don't think Okay, but fuck it. Good guy. Good guy. Yeah, check him, Elijah Warren, man. Y'all look out for him, man. Yeah, for sure. Way, for real. Uh, but yeah, man, Leroy III, man. Oh, your social media. You want to get social media? Oh, yeah, for sure. Y'all can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok. I don't really fuck with the TikTok. But uh, also on YouTube, uh, Leroy III. That's L E R O Y T H A T H I R D. Oh, and I definitely got to plug my hashtag, I Hate People shirts. If you've been in Houston, you, I'm pretty sure you've seen them or passed by. I have the hashtag, I hate people. Professional shit talker. And the fuck. It's spelled T H A F U Q, question mark, exclamation. And all my shirts are public friendly. And the meaning of my shirt is I, I love people to death. I just hate the ways of ignorant motherfuckers. <laughs> so you can put your own meaning on the motherfucker. Y'all get at me. Leroy the third. All the custom shirts and all that shit. And I was going to bring you one, but you a large. XL on that. XL? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's what it is, man. Hey, man, it's Donnie Houston Podcast, Leroy the Third. Hey, man, we up out of here. Donnie Houston. Donnie Houston. Oh, yeah. Donnie Houston. 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 Donnie